But if he's talking about the great controversy in parables, I'm anxious to hear about that. Our speaker is an attorney, former director of Advent Hope, and president of Word Radio, FM 107.3. What I say? What? 107.3. Say it with me. 107.3. They can't forget it. They'll know to turn to 107.3 to hear the message coming through the radio. We're very happy to have you with us this morning. Know that God's going to bless us because of your message that you have prepared. Thank you. Well, it's an honor to be here today. Um, before I begin, I do want to just say a little bit about the radio. It means an awful lot to me. Um, I don't know, how many of you have heard Radio 107.3? Anybody? I see a few hands here. Good. Excellent. I'm glad you guys have heard about it. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I'd like to apologize for some of the quality control problems that we've had. Um, but this is a labor of love. Um, it's a very, very small team that have been putting it together. Um, I've been spearheading this uh, locally. Um, there's uh, two other people that have worked very closely with me. They're not, they're not local in the area, though. Um, we started broadcasting about a year ago. We broadcast out of Ukaipa, and uh, you can get it here. I listened to it all the way to the church, and it goes down Interstate 10 to about Sierra. I want to say something about that. Um, these kind of stations are um, not very powerful. I can't afford a powerful station. But I think God worked it out just perfectly that we could place our antenna, that if you look at where we hit, we hit right down Interstate 10. And if you look at what people are doing today about how they listen to the radio, there's really only one place where I've got a captive audience, and that's when they're sitting in traffic. And I could catch them all the way from Sierra Avenue all the way up through to Yucaipa and a little bit out towards Banning and Beaumont. And so anyway, I want you to keep that in prayer. Um, we've recently made a decision to go to 100% local control of the programming. Um, but right now, that's kind of a transition that we're going into. And so um, bear with us as to what you hear on the radio right now. Basically, what's going on is we have a collection of files that we can play. And we have a computer that's sitting there randomly picking one file to play next. And we're going to work, though, towards having a real schedule and towards having some music back so that we have a little bit of relief for the audience. But right now, it's, it's spoken only. And so I think over the course of the next couple of months, It'll improve, and I want to be able to encourage you to listen to it, and I want you to be able to encourage your non-Adventist friends to listen to it, and most importantly, keep it in prayer. I believe that this is something, the way I like to think of it, it's a force multiplier that makes your evangelistic efforts easier because the radio's out there 24-7, plugging away, doing its thing, and people can tune in. The people that have that desire in their heart, that are bored, that are listening through the thing, they can tune in. And then when you get there to talk to them, you'll find out they know something. And it can be a really beautiful thing, and it's my prayer that this will be a blessing to your and our local community here. Um, before I begin, I'd like to start with a word of prayer, if we can bow our heads. Dear Lord, I ask that you would be with me Lord, please send your Holy Spirit to anoint my lips, and may I speak your words and not my own, and may we be led into all truth. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this sermon today comes out of a study I was uh, doing. I, I study with a couple of different um, weekly Bible study groups, and one of them was focusing particularly on how to study the great controversy. And they asked me to do one of the studies, and this led to a bigger and bigger study, which is the result of what you'll hear today. But specifically, I was looking at the great controversy in the parables, and specifically, I was looking at how does it regard Christ, what can we learn about Christ in the great controversy, and also what we can learn about our own roles in the great controversy. And honestly, when I was looking at this, I hadn't heard anyone do this before, so it was kind of fun for me to go through and to look and decide which parables would be the most interesting, the most fruitful for this. You know, parables are really powerful teaching tools, and I'm so, we are all so blessed 
that Christ chose to use these. Um, they can be understood simply and easily. A parable is something that you can tell to a child. It's not something like a big doctrinal dissertation, you know, that, oh, you need to be old and wise, and then you can understand this. No, a child can, can get it. And if we look at what Christ did, actually, he spent more time talking in parables than he did in any kind of doctrinal um, discussion. I mean, sure, he talked about doctrinal issues, and there's no question the parables address them, but there's something powerful about a story. And stories can kind of just draw us in. And so I'd like to dive right in. We're going to look at a few parables, and we'll talk a little bit about some other areas outside of parables. I hope you brought your Bibles. Um, I am going to be using a lot of Bible texts, and I hope you have them. Uh, this is going to be very much a Bible study. So let's start right now. I'd like to start by turning into Matthew 21. Matthew 21. I just want to show how simple and wonderful the parables work. Um, looking at verse 28, we'll start right there. Christ is talking to the, um, to the priests and to the, uh, to the leaders in, in, in Jerusalem. And he gives this little story. He says, but what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he repented and went. He came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Very interesting, you know. This actually, to me, raises some interesting questions. How many of you know people that say they worship the Lord, but then do nothing? And how many of you know people that for some reason say they don't worship the Lord, but yet live a great life. Now, I'm not saying that just living a great life is enough to be saved. I do think, though, that there's a powerful lesson in this story, a very, very powerful lesson. And I take a lot of hope from this particular story, and that's this. We should not judge the other people around us because we don't really know. And, and what I love about this is that Christ so quickly told this little story here, and the point of it, he, he states, verse 31, he says, Whither of them twain did the will of his father? They say to, unto him the first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward, that ye might believe him. It's very, very simple, and I'm, but you could spend a lot of time picking this apart if you were going after it doctrinally. But yet Christ did this in such a simple way that even children can understand this story. But let's dive in and let's look at Christ in the great controversy as parables. And I'm just going to keep going right here into verse 33. Christ says this, Hear another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about, and digged a wine press in it, and built a tower, and let it out to husbandmen, and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen, that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants, and beat one, and killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more, more than the first, and you could read this as being more honorable than the first. And they did unto them likewise. And last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandsmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let, his, let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, and cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. When the Lord thereof of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto these husbandmen? They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builder rejected, the same is become the head of the corner? 
This is the Lord's doing, and, it's marvel and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and shall be given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. When the chief priests and the Pharisees had heard this parable, they perceived that he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. Let's pick this one apart for a second. It's a simple parable. We can all understand it. But let's, let's pick it apart. And I want to point out one thing in particular that it doesn't say that I think sometimes can confuse us in the church. Well, first of all, what do the different people represent? You have the householder. He plants a vineyard. And then he hires some husbandmen to take care of it. It's clearly God the Father, is it not? And he plants this vineyard. And, and when we look at this, we can see that it's actually written towards the Jews. Just as the priest perceived it, it was written towards them. And it's the story of Israel and how they treated the prophets. How did they treat everyone that was sent to them? Now, before we get too smug and think, oh, well, this is a story for the Jews. How have we treated all prophets through all time? It's always been bad. And look, look at the disciples. Look at what them, God sent them to the Gentile world. And how did they all die? All but one was martyred. And the one that was martyred, he was boiled in oil, and it was just a miracle of God that he survived. So anyway, so we see this story, and we see the husband, God the Father, sending his prophets. Now, I ask you, who's the husbandman in this situation? Well, we could answer that question in a number of different ways. Um, we could answer it as the priests, but this seems to be universal and seems to go throughout all time. It seems to be the same treatment at all times. Um, I would say that the true leader of the rebellion is Satan, is it not? And so, and so the husbandman is kind of the ruler of this world. And so, so who is the ruler of this world? I, I want to run you through a few texts very quickly, um, just, to, just to prove a point. And you have to forgive me. I, I'm an attorney, and I like to back everything up with evidence. And so I will use texts to support these things. So turn with me, if you will, quickly. Uh, time is going to go quickly on us. Let's go to John 12. Um, keep your finger there in Matthew, because we'll probably ref we will refer back to that. But I want to look at John chapter 12, because I don't want there to be any confusion here. John 12. And we're going to look at verse 31 and 32. Christ is speaking here, and he's saying this. Now is the judgment of the world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Now, there's a couple things I want to point out here. Who's the prince of this world? Satan. Satan. Exactly. And then Christ, if Christ be lifted up, he will draw all men to him. Now, if you look in the King James Bible, if you have one of those, you can see that word men is italicized. It was supplied. That means it was supplied by the translators. It's not actually, it's not actually part of the, um, of the text. And when you think about that, this is an important point in the great controversy. Because when Christ died on the cross, he died to save you and me, but is that all he saved? No. No, no. He saved the entire universe. Had Christ not come and been lifted up on the cross, the great controversy which started in heaven, the argument going on in heaven, it wouldn't have been solved but for the fact that Christ came and died on the cross. And we know from reading Spirit of Prophecy that there were still beings in the universe who were watching who hadn't completely, 100% had it all settled in their mind until Christ was lifted up on the cross. And so we see the whole, this is the great controversy encapsulated in just two little verses. Now, just to continue to make this point about the prince of the world, um, John 14, 9, we see the same thing there. Excuse me, 14, 29. Um, 14, 29. Christ says this, And now I have told you before it came to pass that when it is come to pass, you might believe. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh, 
and hath nothing in me. So we see that Christ, the Satan, is the prince of the world at this point. Now, how does the prince of the world work? There's actually a little bit of a clue in the last text we read, because if Christ says, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. Look with me and go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we're going to read verses 3 and 4. Uh, Paul is talking here. He says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid from them that are lost. So what's the gospel? It's the, new, it's the good news about Jesus Christ, right? It's the fact that he died on the cross. And he says, If our gospel be hid, it is hid from them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. So that's Satan, the, the, the God of this world, the husbandman blinded the minds of them which believed not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine unto them. So, what's the goal of the prince of this world? It's to keep the gospel hidden. To keep it hidden. But Christ, if Christ be lifted up, he will draw all men to him. I'm going to be sure here that we've... Uh, I'm going to go back to my Matthew 21... So, I think in the interest of time, we, we've got the point of what this story was about. Let's go ahead and continue on to the next parable. Let's go to Matthew 18. Matthew 18, and we're going to look at verse 12. This is the parable of the lost sheep. Matthew 18 Verse 12, how think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth unto the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. So, Christ is the shepherd, and he's looking for his sheep, and he's going after that one. And this is a powerful, powerful lesson. Um, if Christ is willing to come after just one of you, just one of us, what does that say about the kind of relationship he has with us? See, you know, in the world, you might fight a war, right? And you might fight a war to go take over another nation, right? But you wouldn't fight a war for one person. Because we don't have that kind of relationship with that one person. But what God has is something very different than the way men approach the world. Men approach the world in kind of big pictures like, like I don't have a relationship with these people, but I want their stuff or I want this big goal or something like that. But Christ is able to have a personal relationship with us. And when you have a personal relationship, it's worth it to go for the one. It's like a father and a mother and their interest in their children. They're interested in that one. But no nation, you know, no president is interested in the one. He can't afford to be. There's too many people on the earth. But God is special, and he can approach each one of us as an individual and that is such a beautiful thing and it shows us the kind of love that he has and so here we see the shepherd that leaves the 99 safe to go get the one how does he do that how does he do that well there's a clue and and this is a repetition of a theme because remember christ said if i be lifted up i'll draw all men to me but look with me with romans Chapter 10. And I want to look at verses 13 to 15. He says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him who they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? 
and how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So what's going on in this great controversy? You see, the prince of this world, he wants to be sure that the gospel is not preached. Because if the gospel's not preached, then the lost will not be saved. But you see, Christ, if he be lifted up, and if people know about it, then people will be saved. And so, therefore, we have this admonition to go and preach so that people know the gospel. Now, let's look at John 10. This is one of my favorite uh, uh, parables. I think it's a very interesting parable. I want to point out something that um, you maybe haven't seen before. Now, it's important to have the context. If you look very carefully um, in, in John here, you will see um, that Christ is in Jerusalem when he's speaking. In fact, right after this uh, parable, it's going to talk about the, uh, the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem. Now, with that in mind, um, where does Christ usually go when he's in Jerusalem? He goes to the temple, right? He goes to the temple to preach. And so, with that in mind, let's look at this parable very carefully. So, John 10, we're going to start in verse 1. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you. I love this. When Christ says, Verily, verily, he's saying, Truly, truly, he's emphasizing a point. I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which spake unto him. Now, I want you to think about this. We'll, we'll continue on with the scripture here, but I want you to think about something. Um, I've had a blessing to, to go to the Holy Land and walk around, and I can see, I've, I saw these shepherds, right? And as particularly in Jordan, I was kind of out in the country, it looks like a desert. It's amazing they can raise sheep out there. And it was getting to be dusk, and the, the shepherd's bringing his, his flock back in. And he's got this little barbed wire-like uh, enclosure, and it's kind of backed up against the cave, so he has to put the barbed wire around like three sides, and he brings all the sheep in, you know, he's got to open up the gate and everything and put them in there, right? But what's different about this parable? Christ isn't talking about that. There's something very, very unique about this. Because if you look in verse 3, he says, To him the portereth open, and the sheep hear his voice. The portereth open? Now, when I was out in the field, there's nobody out there but one shepherd and some barbed wire fence and some sheep. There's no porter, there's no one there that the shepherd can say, <clears throat> excuse me, but um, can you open the door so I can bring the sheep in? It doesn't happen. Remember where Christ was. There is one place where there is a sheepfold where there's a porter that opens the door. And as far as I can tell, there's only one place in all of Israel, perhaps the world, where this happens. Where? Where would this happen? Where would you be the shepherd that gets to walk up and say, hey, open the door, I'm bringing my sheep in? At the temple. At the temple. If Christ is at the temple and he's giving this parable, he can look out and he can say, hey, look, guys, look at this. I'm going to teach you a lesson about what I see here. You know, and he talks about the shepherd and the good shepherd and going through the door and, and the porter and all these other kinds of stuff. This is the one place they bring the sheep to be sacrificed and they've got to have a lot of sheep and they've got multiple sheep pens outside the temple and there's a very controlled process for bringing the sheep in and you have a porter there now one of the other things that we kind of miss um, and, I, and I wish we didn't but 
when you look at what was going on at the temple, there was a lot of sheep being sacrificed. And because there was a lot of sheep being sacrificed, there was kind of like a little division of labor amongst the priests to be sure everything was, was done properly and in good order. And if you were going to bring a sheep into and make it up to that, that, that uh, fold just before you go in to be sacrificed, your sheep had to be inspected by a priest. And your sheep is inspected by the priest to see if he has any flaws. And if he doesn't have any flaws, then he's given a seal. And then when you go on in to have the actual sacrifice and you've selected your sheep, the, the priest that's going to do the sacrifice with you, he sees if there's a seal or not. So I want you to think about these sheep is actually special sheep. These are not the average sheep. This is not the average flock. So let's keep reading here. Um, I think we should start in verse 7. No, I think 6. I don't know, we'll start at 6. This parable spake Jesus unto them, <coughs> but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you that I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they may have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. This is really, really big stuff, heavy stuff here. This is one of my very most favorite passages of Scripture. And I think about this so many times about what the Christian life is about. Christ really did come. We may have life and have it more abundantly. And I want you to think about this, because sometimes we go through trials. Sometimes the Christian life isn't easy. Sometimes there's problems. And sometimes it's not obvious to us, especially in our fleshy, uh, sinful nature, to think that life is more abundant in Christianity. Wouldn't it be so much more abundant if I just compromised and did this over here? But in the big scheme of things, that is totally false. That's a lie of the devil. And remember, Christ came we may have life and have it more abundantly. And Christ says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep or not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is a hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and have known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. So here's another important lesson here. Christ is not just sent to the Jews. He is not just the good shepherd of the Jews. He has other sheep. And this is such a blessed thing because this is how we all come in, right? This is how we all come in. There's starting to be a theme woven in here. Therefore doth my Father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down for myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received from my Father. There was a point um, that I wanted to make uh, back when we were talking about the parable of the tenants. Um, when we see these parables, it can lay bare some doctrinal issues very nicely. Now, what I'm going to say next, I... I pray about and I pray that it'll be taken, uh, you know, taken it for what it's worth and not taken too, too far. Um, because we have other passages in scripture that require our, 
our study and our, our, our look at, right? And so I'm not, I'm not trying to contradict any other scripture, but I just want to point out something about how we can go wrong in our doctrinal arguments. Remember the first story, the story about the husbandman who sends his prophets and they're killed and he thinks, finally, I'll send my son and the son is killed? Now, after the son is killed, does the father say, you know what? You killed my son. Therefore, I love you. Does he say that? No, he says, he says, what will happen? He says, vengeance will come. That father, when he comes, is going to strike vengeance. And I think that that's really important because sometimes, sometimes we have this feeling that the only reason why God the Father loves us is because Christ died for us. And there's some false doctrine that goes around about what the nature of the blood of Christ actually does. And I'll talk more about this towards the end of my discussion here. But I think it's important to point out that God the Father acts just like any other father. He loves his son, and killing his son is no way to make friends with the father. But it doesn't mean that all this wasn't part of the big plan. And when you look at the big plan, you start to see it, see it revealed here in what Christ says in chapter 10, because verse 17, therefore doth my father love me because I laid down my life that I might take it again. So the father loves Christ for what he is going to do. And there is no question that the blood of Christ is incredibly important to us and that this is our way of salvation. Because you see, the wages of sin is death and all sin leads to death and there is a price that has to be paid and we can claim that. But we don't want to get into the situation where we get into so much doctrinal kind of contortions that we end up with this image of the Father that is nothing like what the father is really like. And we can see that in the parables as to what the father is really like. And he's not that different than, than us. We can relate to him and he can relate to us. And I think that's a, a beautiful and important lesson that we get from reading the parables. Now, we see here that Christ came. He came the mission to the Gentiles as well as to the Jews. Christ says here that he can lay down his life and pick it up. For Christ to be able to do this, there are two things that have to be true. Otherwise, impossible. Impossible unless these two things that were true that are completely unique to Christ. The first thing, if the wages of sin is death, the only way he can pick it back up is if he's sinless. Otherwise, he'd have no right, no ability to, correct? And the other thing, just because you're sinless, you aren't going to be able to pick your life back up unless you're God. And so we see here two important attributes of Christ in that he is both sinless and God. Now, when we look at this parable, we see the sheep. And the sheep are following the shepherd, right? He talks about how the sheep know the voice of the shepherd and they follow him wherever he goes. And we also see that these sheep are special. They have a religious significance. This is not your average sheepfold. And as I was thinking about this and praying about this, I believe the Spirit led me to another passage. And I was thinking about where do we see a group of people following the lamb wherever he goes. Where? Revelation. Revelation 14. Revelation 14, we can see another kind of, I would say, almost fulfillment of this parable. Turn with me, if you will, to Revelation 14. Revelation 14, and we'll just look at a couple verses here. We're going to look at verse 1. And it says this, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him 144,000, 
having his father's name written on their foreheads. Well, this is a loaded thing, and we could spend a number of sermons just looking at the 144,000, but what do we know about the 144,000? Well, we know from studying them out very carefully that these are, these are the, the special elect called of God, and these are the ones that are sealed. And we can, we can see the seal right here, having their father's name written on their foreheads. That kind of goes with that, right? So we see the 144,000. They're with the lamb. These are special people. Now, skip with me, if you will, down to verse 4. These are they which, have not def which were not defiled with women. And we know in... Um, in Revelation, that a woman represents a church. For they are virgins. These are the, they which follow the lamb wheresoever he goeth. Just like those sheep back in the parable, right? These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to, their, and, and to the lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are with they are without fault before the throne of God. So these are people who can be sealed. Now, I don't want to draw this too far because there's no question Christ is the sacrifice for us. And 144,000 aren't that, right? But yet, we're called to be like Christ. And we're called to a certain Perfection, just as those lambs have to be perfect in order to be taken in and used as a sacrifice. And here we see the 144,000. They have something special about them. They've found no guile. Um, there's nothing, nothing wrong in them. They're, they're without fault. So there's something special. So, so, so how do you do that? I mean, this is a, this is a big thing. And, and, and believe me, we could teach some false doctrines on this if we just drove forward, you know? But we can look at the parables and we can figure it out. We can figure out how we fit into the great controversy. And so turn with me, Will, to another parable. I want to go to Matthew 22. I'm going to start in, in verse 8. Now we're running out of time, so I'm not going to read the entire parable. I'm just going to focus in on the part that I want to focus in on. Um, verse 8. Um, basically what's happened is you've, you, you've got a certain king. He wants to have a wedding feast. He sent out his normal friends to come. They say, forget it. We're not coming. We're busy, right? And so then he said to his servants, verse 8, the wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find bid to the marriage. This is beautiful. He's sending the gospel out to everybody. So these servants went out to the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. Now let me tell you something about a Jewish wedding. In a Jewish traditional wedding, especially back in this time, I don't know if they're doing anything like this now, but the guests were all supposed to wear a robe of white. And if they showed up to the wedding without a robe of white on, that was no problem. Because the host of the wedding always had white robes to give them. So if you showed up, no problem. Here's your robe. Come on in, right? It's no problem. Now, now what does the robe represent? Our character, right? Christ's righteousness if you have a white robe, right? And when the king came in to see the guest, verse 11, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. What a strange thing. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou to the wedding, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. You see, this man could have had the robe, the character of Christ. All he had to do was accept it. And so to be the 144,000, to have that perfection, I'm not going to say that this is maybe easy, but all you have to do is accept it. And you can have it. And it's not you that produces that. It's Christ. It's the wedding host that gives it to you. But if you don't, man, the king's going to come to you and you're going to be speechless. Verse 13, then said the king to the servants, 
bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What a terrible fate. And I pray that this will happen to none of us. I wish it would happen to no one at all, but we don't live in the world where all will be saved. So, what is being said here? Now, I'm going to go to Romans. What does it mean? What does it mean to put on that garment? I just want to read just one quick little passage so you can understand exactly what I'm saying. Romans 6. There's so much to unpack with this. But this is fundamentally... I believe is how it's done. No, Romans 6, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, with Christ, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should ser not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. So ultimately, we have to be dead to the world. We have to share in what Christ did. You see, Back to that parable where they're looking at the sheep. We have to be like those sheep in the fold. And those sheep in the fold look just like the lamb. The lamb of God that was sacrificed. So, so what does that mean? What does it mean? What does it mean to be crucified with him? Well, it's a tough thing, actually. And it can go to great lengths. I mean, really great lengths. If you look at some of the disciples... Man, Peter, he was crucified upside down. Let's look at the last, last parable that I'm going to look at today. John 15. John 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Christ is the vine, we are the branches. Let's look at this. Every branch that beareth not fruit, cut off, gone. But... Every branch that does bear fruit, it's pruned. That doesn't sound real comfortable, does it? Christ goes on to say, to speaking, Now ye are clean. How are they clean? Through the word which I have spoken unto you. Through gospel. Right? Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. So, so what's being called for here? See, sometimes we get the great controversy wrong. Sometimes we get it wrong, like we say, you know, there's nothing I can do to be saved. And that on its surface is a true statement. Christ saves us, he does the work. But does that mean we're just like, okay, go take a nap. You've been saved, right? <laughs> Praise God. But no, that is not what Scripture teaches. Scripture teaches that we have to abide in Christ. And if we abide in Christ, we're going to get pruned. And if we get pruned, we're going to bear fruit. That is not taking a nap. That is not following the concerns of this world and saying, God took care of it for me. I mean, yes, he did. But we have a place and a role. And it is very, very clear from Scripture. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. We can't do anything without Christ. But with him, we can, and we bring forth how much fruit? 
Much fruit. Much fruit. If a man abideth not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. So if we don't abide in Christ, cut the whole branch off, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. You don't want to be here. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, the gospel, ye shall ask what ye, what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. Now, I think this is interesting, too, because how is God glorified? By the fruit we bear. Now, we can't do it without Christ. Don't get me wrong. I don't want anyone to go out of here going, i got to go bear fruit. No, 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 no. You've got to abide in Christ. If anything, you go out of here going, like, I need to abide in Christ. But you must bear fruit. And it's beautiful, the role we play, because, because when we bear fruit, we actually give glory to God. And that's, that's an amazing thing when you think about this, this universe. I mean, look at this world. In many ways, it's such a miserable place. And, and, and we're miserable people in so many ways. And, you know, especially compared to the God of this universe. Perfect in all ways, beautiful in all ways, surpassing everything, you know? And yet we can glorify him with our fruit. And what fundamentally is our fruit? It's bringing others in, right? It's preaching that gospel. And so it's by us doing God's will that we bear fruit and we glorify God. This is, this is, this is beautiful stuff. And then look at what Christ weaves in next. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Love is really at the, at the core of all this stuff. He says this, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. <clears throat> These things, have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Now look at his commandment here. This is, this is key. I want you to keep this in mind. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now, this is beautiful. There is no greater love than Christ coming to die for us. But what does Christ say to us? Love one another as I've loved you. You have to love one another the way Christ, the greatest of all love. And so when you see the whole great controversy and what's going on here, it's so easy sometimes to divorce it from love and turn it into some kind of a doctrinal dissertation. And it's just not. Love is at the core of all of these things. So, what have we learned about Christ's role in the great controversy? What was the point of Christ coming to this earth? Well, first of all, Christ didn't come to appease the Father. The Father loves us, just as Christ loves us. And he didn't suddenly love the people that killed him because his son died. Now, Christ did come for an important reason, and he needed to die for an important reason, and it does go with his relationship to the Father. And that is, he came to fulfill the law because the wages of sin are death. So, so he made a way for us. And that's another study. That's another study. But, but here we can see in the study that we've done now is we've seen that the Father, he's, he's, we're made in his image, and he loves his son like we would love a son. And, and he loves us for loving his son. And he loves his son for what he did. 
He loves his son because he had a good son who did the right thing and laid down his life for us. I mean, these are all beautiful, beautiful, beautiful lessons. Christ also came, though, to do something else. Remember, he says, if I be lifted up, the prince of this world is gone, right? He came to reveal Satan as a murderer. Because remember, Satan is lying and saying like, hey guys, follow me. I'm the angel of light. I've got all these great things. I mean, this is wonderful. Blah, blah, blah. On and on and on. I don't know all the different arguments he makes. I don't even want to make them. But Christ says, Satan, you're a murderer from the very beginning. And when Christ comes and dies on that cross, he reveals Satan as a murderer. And, and he reveals everyone who's a follower of Satan as being in that camp. It's really important for us that we make the right choice as to who we follow. We are not, we, we need to see Christ for who he is because he is the great, the great shepherd, the good shepherd. And he, he loves us, and we need, to, we need to recognize that Satan is the murderer. We need to recognize that Christ came that we may have life abundantly. So, what about, what about the killing anyway in the Bible? You know, sometimes we want to have this kind of great controversy where everybody's saved. That seems to be real popular in the world. If you go and you talk to your non-Christian friends, they, you're going to run into this. Everybody's saved. There's got to be some way. Oh, I'm basically a good person, you know. Um, Romans 12, verse 19. I don't want to misquote it. You know it. Um, Twelve, verse nineteen. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, "Vengeance is mine; I will repay," saith the Lord. It's important to keep this in mind as we think about the great controversy. Is that? There's a lot at stake here, and we don't serve a namby-pamby God who is just going to save everybody because, you know, wouldn't that be nice, right? No, we serve a God of justice, and he's going to do the right thing. And as we can see from that first parable, the right thing is vengeance. And it's not a pretty thing. It's referred to as God's strange act. But we need to remember that that's a part of the great controversy and that, and that the, the battle being waged here is one where, you know, the, the players, they play for keeps. So what do we see of Jesus' death? It draws all men to him. It pays the price for sin. It breaks the power of the evil one because you have this gospel, this gospel of Christ, and the power of the evil one is gone and it's broken. It reveals the true nature of the evil one. And so I want to ask you, where are you in this great controversy? Are you a tenant? Are you working that field? Are you working with men that want to kill him and take his inheritance? How absurd is that? The people think that they can kill Christ and take his inheritance. You know, when you look at that, you're like, really? But yet, isn't that what we see in the world? I think that's really what the Jewish leaders had in mind when they killed him. You know, some of them, when they're arguing about Christ and who he is and blah, blah, blah. I think they knew who he was. When the Sanhedrin and the, and the different trials that night, Christ said they, they knew who he was and they thought, we'll kill him and we'll take his place. Everything will go on. We'll continue to be the high priest 
and the rulers of Jerusalem, right? That's what they thought. And yet, we think that's strange and absurd, but yet is there not a power that still tries to do that today? If you look in scripture, it talks about how the leaders of the church at the time of Christ sat in the seat of Moses. And that was their seat of judgment. They said the seat of Moses. There, you know, I, I want to stand by my real Adventist heritage, the real Protestant heritage. There is a power today who says, I sit in the seat of Peter. And I take the place of. I take the place of Christ. There's a power that says that today. But we see from the parable what the end is, what the end is of these things. And so I ask you, in this great controversy, are you going to try to just sit in the middle and, you know, take the easy route, let God handle it all? Or can you see that you're either a good tenant or a bad tenant? You're either a good servant, connected to the vine, producing fruit, being pruned. Oh my. Let me tell you something. I've been pruned a few times by God's grace. It's not comfortable. And I'm sure some of you have stories of being pruned. But it's the choice you have to make. Where do you want to be? Where do you want to be? And finally, I ask you about those sheep, those sheep in the fold at the temple, ready, receiving the little seal from the priest so that they could go in and be sacrificed. Are you willing to make that commitment? I pray that you will make that commitment. I believe when you look at the parables, it is clear as day that the story of the great controversy is there. And the issues that are stake, at, at stake, they're there. And so I want to make an appeal to you today. And my appeal to you today is to be fruitful. It's not, I won't say it's easy, because I'm not here to tell you it's easy, but the formula isn't that hard. When you look at John uh, 15, we're talking about the vine and the branches. Christ says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. That's clear. This is how to be fruitful. He goes through all of this thing to say, you got to have fruit, right? And then at the very end, he says, and here's the commandment. Here's how you do it. Love one another as I have loved you. But he gives a little, another little explanation. This is, a, this is something that's deep on the heart of Christ. And I want to look at this, John 13, our text for today. Before I say it, I want to say this about the world. There's a lot of information out in the world. There's a lot of people making a whole lot of claims. There's a lot of different claims for salvation through many, many different ways. You can go join some new age group and be a vegan and get saved that way. Um, you can do a whole bunch of different stuff. Do you have time to check out all these different religions to see which one's right? Nah. Do the people out there who need to be saved, do they have time to check out all those religions to see which one's right? No, they don't either. But God gives us the formula, the formula that will give us success, I truly believe, is right here in John 13, 34 and 35. A new commandment I give unto you, that you want love one another as I have loved you. That's the same as we just saw, right? Ye that you, that ye also love one another. But check this out. This is the promise. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. 
So I want to submit this. Success in being fruitful starts right here at home. It starts right here in the church. It's we need to really show love to each other. And I believe that as we do that, we will become attractive to other people. And as we become attractive to other people, that gives us the opportunity to show the love of Christ to them. That gives us the opportunity to raise up Christ and raise up the gospel. So anyway, I hope each one of you will go back and study these parables. They're full of very simple truths, easy to understand, even a child can understand. And I pray that each one of you will recognize your role in the great controversy and that you will play that role to the fullest that Christ would have you. Um, I would like to go ahead and, and, and close this with a, with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for your scripture. I thank you for the simple stories of the parables. I praise you that you don't need a great doctrinal discussion to understand the great truths of scripture. Lord, I pray for each one of us that we would abide in you and in your love and that we would follow the commandment that you give to us to love one another. And that, Lord, I understand that we may go through a time of pruning. Pray for each one of us that we will have the strength and the desire to submit to you that we, we too may be pruned and that we may bring forth fruit. Lord, I pray for abundance for all of us so that you, not us, but you would receive the glory. And Lord, we look forward to your return. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand as we sing our closing song.
bow our heads. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time that we could come to worship together. We thank you for this Sabbath day. Lord, I ask that you would go with us now as we go our separate ways or stay for the fellowship dinner. We thank you so much for everything. We pray this in Jesus' name.